All right, let's start. All right, that's enough. I have to write a rap about Swift. Uh, probably as short as uh, the song from James. It's just a verse and then source gets service crash. Um, that's very low. Can you give me a little bit more? Thank you very much. Um, all right, uh, let's start with this panel. Uh, uh, first of all, I have a very important announcement for all the beloved... Somebody's coming in. Michael! Um, for all the beloved uh, dead animal eaters ab among us, I have a very amazing news, which is that you remember what Lex said about uh, making decisions. I kind of reversed a little bit the decision and uh, we will have meat tomorrow. <laughs> I didn't say we will have a lot of meat. I said there will be some meat, so the first one being there will have it. Uh, <laughs> um, yeah, that's exactly what Lex was saying this morning. Anyways, um, all right, let's for this panel, uh, it's which is going to be shorter because we're running super late and we're still wearing rubbing, but she's uh, just arrived, actually. That's funny, I didn't. <laughs> mean to say we're waiting for you just when you enter, actually. <laughs> Welcome. Um, so for this panel, I will have a couple of people which I will introduce, and the first one of these will be uh, will be when I click on the button. Uh, Wolf, where are you? Come down, come with us, join us. So it's basically just like every year, the panel uh, is composed of all the speakers from the day, and uh, so if you guys remember, it's in in different orders. Uh, I will now uh, introduce somebody which, uh, which we just left a couple of minutes ago, which is Marcel. Where are you, by the way? There. <laughs> and number three, Mr. Lex Friedman. <laughs> so we will, we will have to share the mics, guys. We have four mics uh, for all of us plus the you guys, because if you guys have a question, obviously, just uh, use the power of asking a question. Number three, uh, number four, if I could count, that would be awesome. Number three on a zero-based index. <laughs> Got it. Um, that would be Michael. <laughs> and since we have a code of conduct which is all about inclusion and all that stuff, yada, 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 uh, obviously I wanted to have my Blitztalk speaker as well. So, Christoph, you're in the game as well. Which I didn't tell you, by the way. <laughs> and as you can see, he's even bigger than the other guys. So, uh, you're about to become famous. Um, all right, let's start uh, with uh, my first topic being watch OS 2.0. Um, so this, yeah, I'm sorry, yeah? Mic number one is starting here. Just, this is this one? Uh, this one, this one, this one is dead. This one, this one is alive. This one is alive. <laughs> oh, this, 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 this one was off. Okay. This one was off. So this one, one, two, three. Actually, they are both off. Whoever did that. That's a, that's a very funny joke. One, two, three. Whoever did that, that's a very funny joke. So, uh, <laughs> this one? This one? Oh, uh, yeah, this one. Oh, one, two, three. I just heard something. Okay, yeah. yeah. Uh, <laughs> it works. Those on off buttons, they're crazy. Um, Anyways, this panel is all about WWDC, actually, uh, or all about the new stuff from WWDC. And one of the things uh, that I wanted to speak is watchOS 2. And f to introduce that, I, I wanted to uh, start with watchOS 1.0, which is the quickest deprecated OS in the history, or at least in my history. Because uh, this thing has been around for, like, at least for us, publicly, for like six months in beta, and for the general public, three months. and so. But this is a general discussion about the, the speed at which we go. Like uh, when I was watching your talks, uh, speaking a little bit about Objective-C and, and missing many, many Swift, uh, I was thinking that Swift is, is pretty soon going to be Swift 3.0, and we haven't seen an Objective-C 3.0 uh, yet, and we will probably never see it. Um, it seems to me that it, it, it's crazy the pace at which we are going, and as a general discussion rules, whoever starts with a mic, um, the, the fact that they had you working on watchOS 1, and then they're like, hey, by the way, redo everything. 
Um, I think, to be honest, that this uh, might not be the general pace of what your OS um, is having, and it kind you could kind of expect something like that to happen uh, at WWDC. Um, I, I feel a little bit like Apple tried to um, screw people by telling them how easy it is to implement a watchOS 1, um, and hey, you just have this little companion, and it's very easy, just, uh, just a quick extension to your actual app. Um, now that many developers have this extension, now they're telling you, hey, by the way, it's not that easy anymore. Now that you have the support, um, you probably maybe just redo all your data um, handling and now it's a complete new app and it's way more complicated and you really have to all these features you can use and you should probably use now. Um, so that's, that's really like, um, I think it was, for Apple it was a very nice way to get as many developers as possible to quickly develop for the watch. Um, because I think if they had released watchOS 2 as watchOS 1, so if this would have been the first release, um, they probably a lot of developers would have thought that it's not worth the the benefit is not worth the effort to do a complete uh, second app uh, besides the iOS application. And um, with this approach, they kind of forced developers into supporting WatchOS too. Yeah, redo your data. Data is easy anyway. So it's and it's all about storyboards, right? On on. <laughs> I think it's it's also clear to me that. Apple set a deadline for when they were going to release the watch and then released it uh, with watch OS 1.0 not being as baked, as finished as Apple wanted it to be. Um, you know, the original Apple Watch unveiling keynote, they showed off features that they didn't, didn't launch and have now reannounced as part of watch OS 2.0. Uh, just some of the different watch faces, the ability to set your own custom photo watch face. They showed it initially and then it wasn't there and now it's going to be there, um, which I think is the maybe even a necessary evil, but the danger of having a hard deadline that you give yourself and telling the entire world when it is, because they could either hold it back and say, well, we're not ready and we're going to delay it and get that bad press, or just release what they had, which is, I think, what they chose to do. They cannot do that for everything, right? Like um, um, HomeKit. I was thinking about Elgato and, and Uli. They introduced HomeKit last year, and they reintroduced it this year, because now it's really ready. <laughs> yeah, but the well, interesting thing, Apple is, is very great in exactly not talking about, hey, we're sorry, we haven't got it ready in time. They're just like, um, they, don't, they don't, don't ship it, and then after a year, they're like, hey, we have this cool new product, and, and they like hope nobody will remember they already introduced that. Yeah, I mean, one of the, one of the things, of course, Apple used to not pre-announce, um, and they've started pre-announcing, and then they found that, like everybody else, they, you know, software is hard, and you can't predict shipping dates, and Oops. So, uh, you know. Oops. <laughs> <laughs> um, all right, let's move to the, to the second thing, which is uh, kind of a more technical one, which is the whole point of running code on the watch. Because um, this, is, this is a big one. Like, when they first were there, they were like, oh, the storyboard's only on your watch. And like, what? Sorry? Can you repeat that? Yeah, I'm, so, I'm sorry. <laughs> and now this time it's like, hey, actually, code is running on the watch. This is kind of a big one, probably for you and for anybody who has done uh, watch OS, right? Um, I think it is kind of a big thing for, especially for the running applications, like the, the, ho the whole sports um, area. Um, but still now, especially with the connectivity, um, it's, to me it's very unclear where you want to run your network code. Because um, again, there is no um, background tasking at the moment. Um, so um, you actually do want to have your long running code on the phone still, but in case the phone is not around, probably the better approach would be instead of showing an error, then trying it on the watch. So I'm not quite sure if they want us to now write all networking code twice, like once run it on the iPhone, and if this doesn't work, then try it on the watch, or what they are up to. Yeah. This is the impression I got from DubDub, by the way. And I was like, uh, can you repeat this? Um, am I really hearing you want me to write twice the same code? on like two different locations. You call super twice too. Uh, use the mic. <laughs> it's, it's always better. You call super twice too <laughs> yeah, and true. things work then. So yeah. That's what it is. That's why you go to the labs, right? Uh, to explain them how it works. Um, so, uh, anybody have any questions, just raise your hand. I will uh, go with the mic over there. Um, and yeah, anybody else wanted to say something on this topic? Um, probably not. So mm -hmm. let's, uh, yeah, all right. Um, you will be part of the panel tomorrow, by the way. So I can feel already that you are. 
Speaking of running code on the watch, um, I wonder if bat about battery life. I mean, it's already a problem sometimes on the 38, but mostly it's a problem because my phone drains mm. for some reason. So if we have running code on the watch, what are your thoughts about how that's going to affect battery life, maybe in general and maybe in particular on the watch? You would know better. Um, well, my experience is that there's plenty of room left on the battery life with watchOS 1 um, and even with watchOS 2 as a beta at the moment, uh, I still have like 30 to 40 percent left um, after a day usually. Um, and so I think they, m because there is no uh, background or multitasking, I think they have this um, under control, I guess. Um, and also with the um, with the iOS 9 beta 2 that came out yesterday, um, also the battery drain on the iPhone is much much better now. Um, I'm like running it th um, from from the beginning uh, of the day, and um, like two hours ago it was like 75, 80 percent something around. So um, it seems like they're getting better there. All right, um, that's it for the watch for today as well, at least. Um, and all the discussion go further after at the dinner. Let I want to speak about iOS 9 and the iPad. Because um, I think iOS 9, as much as it's awesome, it's really awesome on the iPad. Uh, uh, for one thing, we have this keyboard usage now, which is like uh, the future of, des of desktop. Um, I was wondering, actually, with, with Andreas, when we were there uh, at DubDub, that it's my, it might be the future of some people at some companies that only do uh, you know, typical office stuff and, and Word and Excel and whatnot, because they obviously don't need a very complicated thing where you can run Xcode. Um, so um, I, I wanted to know what's, what's kind of your take on, on that. Probably you could answer well, that. My take here is that I think that iOS 9, when it's released and when people see what it does, will then lead to the first quarter where iPad sales go up again. Um, I think it'll be a big deal. I do believe the rumors about a, a larger iPad getting released. And I think that when it gets released, that Apple will finally put out another um, keyboard accessory because they the very first iPad launched with a keyboard dock then they said now we're just gonna sell the Apple Bluetooth keyboard and I think that they're gonna have a surface-esque keyboard accessory for a larger iPad that'll thank you for the term yeah surface-esque oh, that's German um, and it's uh, <laughs> but I think it'll connect um, you know I think it'll be smart cover Did you said connect or connect uh, with the O <laughs> oh, okay. but uh, I you know I think it's gonna be I think that you're exactly right, though, that they're going to be trying to position it as a, a laptop replacement for a, a pretty distinct class of user, and that they'll probably be successful at it. Show of hands, who still has an iPad 1? It kind of still works, right? Yeah. Which is amazing. It's iOS 5, it's running iOS 5, used by my kids now in the meantime. I went from, I, from iPad 1 to um, iPad Air 2 last year, uh, so and all the time around. I'm not a very, I'm not a big iPad user. The main reason why I have an iPad is because I'm a developer. Now, show of hand for who have this keyboard thingy for the iPad One. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, that's a lot of people, actually. Seriously, like three. I, I, I thought I, I was going to be the only one raising my hand. <laughs> well, I think one of the reasons that your iPad One is still useful is because the iPad, and I have, I have two, um, is not that useful, and it hasn't gotten more useful, really. Um, which is sad because you know when you when you go back to the you know hey let's go back to history and you know the uh, personal computing how did that start right with Alan Kay's Dynabook and the iPad could be the Dynabook yeah. but it's not right because you can't actually do that much with it and I think that's such a missed opportunity um, because it's it is such an amazing device and it's so but but because it's locked down it becomes you know I mean essentially it's a Kindle for me. I don't know. How about? Yeah. I, I mean, I'll, I'll I'll disagree though. I I find it extremely useful. I mean, I I use a, a either an iMac or a MacBook Pro all day, but I find the when I want to stop working finally and have a different computing device where I can still do stuff and read stuff and find stuff, but not have all of my work quite as easily accessible. That's when I'm really happy to switch to the iPad. And does a good job filling that need. But that's, I mean, that's kind of what you're saying, right? You're, it's, it's useful for you because it is less useful. Right. <laughs> <laughs> which, is, which, is, which is actually true. I mean, I, I, it's, it's, it's very similar for me. But I wish it, you know, I mean, and, and, and that role is, is a good role. But uh, on the other hand, I, I, I wish it did more. And I think that that's, I don't know if this will work. Uh, it's, it should be working. I do think, though, that, um, that iOS 9 is going to change that. 
like to me the biggest factor is that it's so annoying to do so many tasks on the iPad right now because of the context switching yeah. and having to go back and forth over and over again. And I feel like if iOS 9's multitasking, even in beta, it continues to work as well as it does and lets you do the picture and picture stuff and put apps side by side, I think it's a big deal. I think it, I think it takes the iPad to a distinct additional level. Totally thank agree. You, and thank and you for and going and to the next one. Sorry, just, just Yeah, go ahead. No, it's really just quick. because you just, um, and I, exactly I'm also really looking again. forward to that. And the only other thing I hope that Apple somehow supports better is I want a stylus on this device. I really want a stylus. I mark, you know, you, you read papers, you mark them up. You need something better than your fingers. So for the iPad, I actually think they are going to have a stylus because for many reasons. We have, one pr we have a project, for example, uh, at 7P where people ha have to actually sign, uh, which is not legally binding at all. Uh, but yeah, it's very hard to sign with your finger. I just wanted to say I don't, uh, I, I really want to mansplain you right now, okay? So um, <laughs> I don't think you want a stylus. I think what most of us want is a pen like, you know, Wacom or something, you know, that you can do a little more with. Sure. I mean, I, mean, I, w I used to work for LiveScrap. I love a pen that interacts, but sort of stylus is kind of the, um, I'll settle for a stylus. <laughs> <laughs> but agreed, yes. So I, I forgot to mention at the beginning of this panel, rule number one, which uh, you guys reminded me, please disagree. <laughs> no. Seriously. No, not. There is nothing more boring than, uh, you have a question? I don't think we should disagree. Oh, yeah. 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 A stylus, yeah. Yeah, a stylus. Every time I hear a stylus, I have to think about Steve. Okay. Oh, a stylus. Well, you, again, you don't, you don't want it required, right, yeah. to operate the device, but essentially for, for doing markup, for doing note taking. Okay. Uh, you need, and, and I mean, we have these, I mean, I have a couple, I have, I have a bunch of them, and yeah, no, they all don't really work. Now, maybe there's one that's better than the other yeah, one I haven't one, tried yet. This um, one from uh, the Jolt, even now it works. Okay. okay. If, you know, if, if and when Apple does release a stylus for the iPad, people are going to say, you know, if Steve were alive, they never would have done this. But Steve, all, Steve said a lot of things that he changed his mind on, right? He said that the <coughs> one and only iPad size was the 10 And who iPad. the hell wants music on their phone? Exactly. God. So he's about <laughs> or videos. Or when it happens, don't listen to that line of criticism. About stylus, there's an awesome one, which is um, the one made by 53, the, the app uh, which won an ADA last year or the uh, before. It's quite awesome. It has pretty, cool, pretty good SDKs, which is implemented in a couple of apps like Sketchnote. Uh, you know, I'm waiting for force touch in iPad for drawing. Until I don't have these kind of technology, I would use a st stylus for uh, note taking, for uh, drawings. We need something to uh, differentiate the touch on the, on, the, on the iPad screen. What is your thinking about it? Okay. When Steve Jobs presents the iPhone with the, this low thing slide about the, and no stylus at all, remembering Palm and, the, and this kind of stuff, this kind of device, it was pretty awesome. But the iPad is a business tool, and I think the, we need a tool like this, uh, like a stylus, with not all applications, but the one which needs uh, precision. And think that was you thinking about it. Um, all right, um, let's move on to. Um, I, I would argue though that the iPad is a business tool because I don't know if it's it's kind of businessy, homey, whatever. Hey, businessy, homey. That sounds <laughs> that sounds awesome. <laughs> it's gonna make the business world way way more funny. Are you gonna uh, beatbox again? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Let's go to Swift, um, because this is Swift Conf at the end of the day. Um, at the end of the day, huh? Um, Swift 2.0. Um, well, first of all, interesting news from Apple. This guy is open source. I mean, it's not every time, every day, like every year that you hear something open source from Apple. Then again, it's like Apple open source. <laughs> yeah, I don't think we'll be seeing apple.github.com anytime soon. Yeah, so, so you mean it's not going to be MIT? <laughs> it might be, you know, uh, uh, they have the Apple public source license, right? Yeah. And uh, that's okay, but it's uh, it's not as composable with other licenses well, as... What's Clang licensed at with? That's a good question. That, that might be MIT or BSC. Because, I mean, that, and certainly LLVM precedes yeah, I mean, that, it, so... Yeah, that's and, totally and I'm kind of assuming it'll 
be in that. That's a good point. That's tree. a really good point. Yeah. Who knows? I, I mean, I mean, and let's hope they just ditch what they did before, because that <laughs> Mac OS Forge was just terrible, right? Yeah. Well, they, they, that, that's gone, right? I, I think the site's still live. Okay. Like, yeah. Now that anyone visits it. <laughs> I mean, WebKit, the way WebKit is open source is pretty cool. Obviously, you wait some time, a long time, between the, the actual WebKit and when Safari is released. But the uh, whole, um, the number of committers and the number of people involved in the project is pretty cool. So imagine we see that on Swift, the language itself, and I think this is totally what Chris Lautner wants. He wants the community to be involved in that. I'm going to take um, an example to that, which is uh, Rails, among, amongst other projects. Uh, I, I used to do uh, Ruby on Rails, and what I love in Ruby on Rails is this op open so the part of this op the open source is that people fix things. And uh, obviously, sometimes Apple is not the best at fixing some of their own stuff. So if some of us help them, we might well, that's shape the language. Well, that's to be seen, right? If how willing are they to accept pull requests? Yeah, and, and yeah the home of not invented here. Right. Uh, yeah. Good luck. Well, I think actually before being happy that Swift will be open source, um, let's first wait if it's the same open source that FaceTime actually is open source, <laughs> like it never <laughs> happens. Um, so I don't, I don't see that. I mean, it, it could easily be take Apple still, I don't know, a year or two to actually publish this mm -hmm. code. Um, so f FaceTime is actually not a big deal because since the iOS 9 beta 2 yesterday, it doesn't work anymore. Uh, that's what they wrote in the notes. So that's maybe because they are now using their open source component. <laughs> yeah. So. yeah, so so you screwed up the code, right? Like uh, you were like, I'm going to do some changes and go to fail. Oh. Um, yeah. Um, well, uh, well, the other thing which is interesting is is we now have try catch. <laughs> like what? Uh, it's like a year later. Like makes me think about you again. About uh, don't say. What, what, we, what did we, we say? Have a better I don't remember what we said last year. I well, no. but basically last year. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. You're, it's ironic. Yeah. It's a, uh, it makes us. A anybody remember remember garbage collection, the future? Oh yeah. Yeah. I was just after crickets. That. Exactly. Yeah. Cricket. Yeah. Yeah. No, this is, I mean, I mean, um, this is really the weirdest thing I've ever seen. Like we, you go and like a year long, you, you argue against uh, Java developers that this is not the way to do Quick it. Quick draw GX, yay. But <laughs> I mean, one could argue though, and by the way, raise your hands uh, in, in, in the room because, I'm, um, because of the sake of willing to be fast, I'm kind of running out of questions and I want this thing to still keep on for a few minutes at least before I, uh, we go to the movie. Uh, but I, I can always figure out questions. Don't, doesn't care about that. Um, otherwise, I will have Lex do us a daily Lex, speak five minutes long <laughs> about your day today. Did you do the daily Lex today? No. Oh. So this is the daily Lex, which is sometimes weekly, right? Yeah. <laughs> Um, so going back to the, the track catch, one could argue that we don't have a track catch, we have a do catch. Ooh, ooh, ooh. What's your point about that, by the way, this try thingy? Well, I, I actually think that you are arguing usually with the Java, uh, Java developers because it's very slow, um, because of all the, it's jumping out of the, the stack trays and all these kind of things. And as to my understanding, that's not the case in Swift. Um, so you don't have the performance um, impact uh, that it has on Java. Uh, even though I don't like the pattern, I think that's still a lot better than exception handling on, uh, for example, Java. Uh, so, um, I mean, on C++, C++ and Objective-C had so-called zero-cost exceptions, <laughs> right? So they were um, uh, setting them up was essentially free. Throwing them was incredibly expensive because they had they actually had to rummage around in the uh, dwarf uh, runtime debug information. Part of it was not stripped, and but uh, so I'm not quite sure why. Why I mean, are you talking about? Actually, throwing the exceptions, or uh, yeah, to, uh, to to my understanding, that's uh, there's no cost cost in throwing them anymore on Swift. So well, because they're uh, not exceptions, right? Yeah, right. So that's so still <laughs> yeah, <laughs> but but, that, but that's the, the the main. I think that's the main argument with. Um, but you're uh, not supposed to throw them that, that much anyway. So yeah. Uh, Funny story is. about that. Uh, I got to port uh, uh, a frame an Android framework to iOS. And um, the whole code being written in Java, there was a lot of try catch. Like, but like, like, I mean, seriously, the Java community is doing like throwing errors at every single possible thing. Oh, because you have to. Yeah, I guess. Right? So because they're checked. Yeah, I was safe from uh, Java and C++ over the years. It's the only thing that. But, anyways, um, um, so I had to implement this, and there was uh, parts where I finally uh, uh, some tiny parts I implemented a, a method called catch. 
which does do uh, that the only thing it did was was basically like a debug print uh, because really a lot of time the way I see it is it, you end up in a catch because it's because of you, the developer. This is the wrong part about using try catch a lot of time is you are throwing an error at the user, which is by the way your fault, not the user's fault. And so this is kind of wrong. Um, but generally, um, uh, kind of a, as a last uh, uh, question, which is probably going to be a long question, the Swift thing, because last year we didn't have any objective clients, so we couldn't speak uh, about Swift, and, 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 and yeah, I could just rename the conference. Um, um, I, I would really wonder what, what's your take, uh, especially you, both of you guys, which are more like the old school objective seers. Uh, and I will, I, agree, I, will, I will take the take from a PHP -er as well <laughs> uh, um, about Swift generally. And what about the move that Apple is doing? Like, kind of, I see it as a more um, high level move, um, again, high level, so to say. It's interesting you use the phrase high level there. I mean, in, in, the, in the sense of a high level language compared to a low level language, that's what I mean. Well, I, I, I think I would probably disagree with that um, because. Go uh, ahead. Uh, Disagree. <laughs> Swift is, I mean, and, and Objective C. I mean, I mean, Objective C is is a, a damaged language, right? That's obviously true. It's a car crash of C and and small talk. Um, uh, but that also means it's a it has amazing range, right? Because small talk is incredibly high level, and C is well, unless you. I mean, it's essentially PDP PDP eleven assembly language with a slightly sugared syntax. So I, I would I, I don't think it's you, you can categorize uh, uh, Swift as moving up because it, it, it it's much more static and it doesn't allow many of the higher level features that that we wanted um, in Objective C. I would say that so w with my history of writing Mac software for very many years, um, Mac software back in the day was C plus plus, and uh, then Next bought Apple for negative four hundred million dollars, and it, then I was, had this thing of uh, Objective-C. And it's, I wrote a popular blog posting at the time, uh, 10 things I, I like about Objective-C, 15 things I hate. So I was not a fan. Um, but over the years, I got comfortable with it, and I saw a, a, lot of, a lot of benefits that I didn't immediately see. And the thing that kind of scares me now about Swift is that a lot of the arguments the old C++ had, say C++ heads had, of how to structure things and kind of they went, went off the, the rails with template metaprogramming. I'm seeing those type of like, like lingual lawyer academic arguments being applied to programming now. They're like Mac programming now, iOS programming now. And this is, I, I think it's in exactly the wrong direction because I want simpler languages that are more composable. And the and, and, and I never got paid for getting the types to line up. No customer ever paid me for that. That's a good point. Yeah. Yeah. But so it's a, academically, it's very interesting. Um, but I, I don't think it's actually applicable to the problems we have today. All right. Phil has a question. The, the thing that worries me about Swift is, um, just to make a parallel, uh, Microsoft with, I, uh, with uh, Windows 8 tried to make an OS that works on everything. It's from, you know, small almost phones to full-size computers. Mm -hmm. And Swift, they're trying to make a language that's going to work on everything. Mm -hmm. You want to make a scripting language. You want to make an app language. You want to make a system language. It's very ambitious, and I, my hat's off to them. You know. Yes, but history shows that these ambitious projects yeah. typically don't end that, well. That too. That's my worry about Swift. What's your take on that? Um, it, pretty much the same thing. It's like, it, it's ambitious, and I'm, you know, Swift is, in, to me, is innovating in very interesting ways. That, uh, trying to span the the, the gap there, uh, the entire divide of different devices, but also the entire thing where it's not being backwards compatible, that you have to run their upgrader thing, that is you know, out of the box thinking. And part of me hope that succeeds because that actually should change some rules about how languages can evolve, right? And, uh, and yeah, so uh, I, I hope it works. <laughs> am, I, am I the only one to be in the under, the, under the impression that Swift is basically Chris Lattner? Uh, yes, I mean it was his pet project, and uh, um, that's I mean that's how things so work. The last time somebody had a pet project at Apple that I remember that was Laurent Sansonetti with Mac Ruby. Mm -hmm. uh, right, it right, didn't yeah, end yeah, up very well, yeah. uh, but this one. Got well, published. this one has m better support. <laughs> Slightly yeah, exactly, better yeah. support. This one got public, mm -hmm. Swift, and I don't think there is any way they will. You should speak well, Swift. 
Well, um, yeah, actually, I think uh, you had an interesting point in your presentation where you basically said that um, Swift basically fixes the wrong problem with the language. Um, like, it's easy, it's better for algorithms. I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't say it. wrong, it's just not yeah, the problem we mostly yeah, have right. as, as um, and programmers. For me, my biggest problem with Swift is that I would really love a statement from Apple on what they are planning in the future. Is Swift something that um, will be there and Objective C will be completely deprecated uh, in, in some way? Or is this, um, is Swift meant to be um, forever in parallel with Objective C? Because in this case, I think it's very interesting because Swift does uh, provide very great ways for algorithm implementations and also the functional approach is very interesting. So if you can switch back and forth all the time with, uh, between these two, um, I think Swift is a very great, uh, great, great language um, to have together with Objective-C. But um, if they're really trying to um, like get, get away from Objective-C and do Swift only, um, that's something that I would find uh, worrisome. Um, I have a comment about that that I, I would also love some direction about that, but I don't think we're going to get any because I don't think Apple yet yeah. knows. Um, they're still trying to figure out. They're really doing a strong push, and they're going to see if that works, but how do, I mean, it's, it's hard to say, okay, we've got this huge foundation uh, you know, of, of APIs and, and SDKs that are built on Objective-C, but we want to do this other language. But to me, I agree with you that Apple probably doesn't know that either, um, but I think the problem there is that to me really signals that we should try to avoid Swift as long as possible just to get them in this, in this uh, uh, state where they say, okay, we can't uh, get rid of Objective-C completely. Um, and that's probably the best way to um, like make Swift go away sometimes. So that's yeah. also probably not what you want. So um, if Apple would make a statement there and say, don't worry, uh, Objective-C will stay around um, and we will improve Objective-C. Um, don't do that. We don't want to deprecate it. Um, that's something that, to me, would um, make Swift um, take up pace probably faster than um, with us not knowing about it. Yeah. So I'm worried actually because uh, while at DubDub, I, it was clear to me that Apple didn't make any huge commitment to Swift. They make a little commitment, but the biggest problem, biggest reason why I'm worried is that every time you speak to some random Apple guy, you realize they are not so much into Swift yet. Many of those, most well, but of that's them. That's normal for big companies. I and especially so. Apple, which is very, f you know, there are many different fiefdoms yeah. that well, they talk to each other, but yeah. only you know under duress. But uh, I mean, and and yeah. for example, the the uh, you know the compiler group doesn't they don't they don't con I mean maybe it's changed now, right? But uh, they 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 don't control the other groups, and they they <coughs> yeah. they now need I mean they need to convince the internal people. Who, for example, garbage collection was hugely controversial inside Apple, um, as we now know with good reason. And there were people saying, "Over my dead body, I'm not doing this." Mm -hmm. Um, and I mean, I just, f I, I think this is public knowledge, for example, even, you know, at, at, at this company in Redmond, which, you know, they have a programming language of their own called C Sharp, but their it? own internal code is like 95% C++. or something C++. Yeah. So that's the same thing. It's like Apple is not eating really their don't own duck food. Well, it's Doc, doc and what, what, what's the other app? Doc is written in Swift and one more. Doc? Which Doc? The Doc. Really? Seriously? Supposedly, I, I, That's yeah. interesting. I read it on the internet. It must be true. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, we, we have to wrap this up. So, um, I have one last question because I feel like there is one guy who didn't speak that much here. Uh, so, um, but so, so that's kind of the up from the top of my head. Uh, who watched, uh, because I thought it was a very interesting session, who watched the, the, the session at uh, DubDub about uh, the whole auto layout thingy and especially UI stack view? I did. Am I the only one? That's kind of frightening. Did you watch it? Yeah. Um, so, 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 what do you guys do you think about the UI stack view paradigm? I, I, I kind of love it. I kind of tend to love it because it's, it's so simple to me that it, in most cases, as awesome as your uh, talk was, it doesn't make a lot of sense to, to wrap your head about around auto layouts. 
But it's finally, it, but it, again, before you enter, it's again one of those things where Apple was like two years ago or three years ago saying, oh, the layout, and then they realized, well, okay, we probably have to make something else. So, uh, well, um, I was, well, I developed the last year on one app that's still not on the market, and we did exactly the same <laughs> by hand with table view cells and something like that. And now they published something when we, Actually, we as a company do not need it any longer, and we will not change it just for the release in two or three months. So, really cool. For the next step, we will definitely use it, but it will still not solve all problems. Yeah. Yeah, I view it as uh, essentially a facade pattern for auto layout, right? It handles a common case, yeah. and that's great. That's exa I wish we had that for core data. Yeah. <laughs> yeah that, uh, um, yeah, so that's that's what I uh, wanted to say too. Uh, that's that's exactly this this common case. Um, but I think with um, stack view, auto layout, and just uh, springs and struts, um, the the main thing I think some people are getting wrong for me um, is um, you don't have to decide for one of these. They are they perfectly uh, you can perfectly mix and match them, and there are uh, a fair number of very very good reasons. Uh, when to still in an auto layout app um, do uh, stuff uh, just by subclassing uh, a view and, and override layout subviews and do the calculations yourself. Uh, and it even for complex layouts uh, can be a lot faster than auto layout. Um, so um, I, I don't uh, think Almost certainly. I mean, faster yeah. in terms of coding or faster uh, in, in terms of... In performance. In, oh, in oh, layouting, yeah. so almost certainly. Almost I mean, always faster. Uh, auto layout is, a, I mean, that's a simplex algorithm, uh, you know, NP, NP hard. Mm. Uh, fortunately, it usually runs in linear time, so, you know, but, but uh, you know, it's, it's very unpredictable, that algorithm, and it can go into corner cases yeah, easily. So I think auto layout is pretty nice to lay out, like, s s views inside a view controller, but if you have, like, a view, a custom view that does some sort of logical uh, positioning, um, it's probably a very good idea to to do this with layout subviews and just use auto layout to mm. put together your final view controller. Um, so if you guys watch this session about um, auto layout and, and UI stack view, this is basically what they say is start with UI stack view and then like uh, do the fine tuning with auto layout. But don't try to make it the other way around because UI stack view is like uh, making so much of the job for you. All right, that's it for this panel. Um, um, we, we will have to come back here at sharp uh, six, uh, four, 430, so like in about 10 minutes or 12 minutes, because we're going uh, to watch the amazing movie from Robin, which is going to join us at, at 430 as well uh, to introduce the movie. And uh, thanks to those guys. And uh, yeah, a round of applause for all of those guys. Go get some fresh air because after that we will put you in the dark.